This is United States History in Chapter 4, Religion and the American Colonies, uh, picking up on pages 54 and following. Let's look at the assignments for this chapter. Uh, again, the section review pages are the same, 60, 63, 66, and 70. Honors, remember to do the start questions. The student activity page is also the same here, 16 and 18. All of this due by Wednesday, September 9, where we will quiz and hopefully have a day of review in there so that the test is on for chapters 3 and 4 will be on Friday the 11th. Again, those dates could change, uh, so pay attention to Google Classroom uh, for any of that. The assignments are listed there as well. We look at the denominational beginnings, established denominations, that idea. Uh, really, the notes pick up here on page 56. First couple of thoughts here are actually notes that are added in compared to your book, so be sure that you're copying down all the notes, still looking for that written copy of your notes as part of your homework grades. Uh, the Elizabethan settlement. Uh, again, Elizabeth is in that time period of Protestants and Catholics who's going to control um, the church, who's going to control then the government. So she's trying to get everybody to be appeased by this idea. In the Elizabethan settlement, she wants a Protestant church. Uh, so the creed of the Church of England was thoroughly Protestant. But she wants to pull the reluctant in by preserving the outward trappings of the old church. It's, it's bishops, so the, the terminology is familiar. The garments are familiar. All of these things to try to keep the people satisfied with the Church of England. But then you have your Puritans. We dealt with them a little bit earlier. Anglicans who thought that the old ceremonies practices were too much like those of the Catholic Church. We need to see some things change. But even among the Puritans, there was a difference of how they thought. Your low church Anglicans agreed doctrinally with the Puritans. Uh, you know, these A Anglicans mean they're still in the Church of England. All right, I agree with you Puritans uh, doctrinally, but I don't have a problem with what things look like. I'm okay with the ceremonies. I'm okay with the structures, the bishops, all of that. So that's your low church Anglicans. Your high church Anglicans held that the church's traditional practices, notably its rule by bishops, were divinely ordained. So these are the people that say God established the Church of England this way. And then you had a group called the Separatists. The whole Church of England's corrupt, and there's nothing that you can do other than just separate from it and start all over. Okay? So, Puritans that come to the New World. They're following the idea of the covenant. We mentioned that earlier in another chapter as well, but that they believe this is how God dealt with mankind through a series of covenants or agreements. So then that was how they dealt with one another as well, that there were covenants or agreements. Um, this then was going to lead to different uh, forms of church structure, if you will. And this, uh, you kind of have to think in terms of uh, what shape it looks like. An Episcopal polity is an authority such as a monarch appoints bishops. The bishops in turn appoint lower officials down to the individual churches. So you get this kind of shape. You know, have a top point and it works its way down. That's Episcopal polity, meaning the people really don't have any kind of voice in who's guiding their own personal individual church. Then there's the Presbyterian polity, though, Members of the congregation elect their rulers. Elders from several congregations then elect the officials for the next level up. So while you're getting down to a narrow level, this one is working from the bottom and working up. Episcopal worked from the top and came down, whereas Presbyterian is working from the bottom and coming up to that leadership. But the people then are having a voice, but they're still in a group, a denomination, that's all following the same authority. Okay. Then there was congregational polity. Each congregation elects its own officers. Each church remains independent of other churches. So they're not answering to someone else. Uh, eventually, this congregational polity was what described most Puritans, and they became known as congregationalists. 
Now, as you see page 57 and move on down through that, though over time the Puritans themselves were going to uh, suffer some difficulties in their own church, that as time passes and newer generations are being born, they're less sold out to the teachings of the church. And in the Puritan uh, colonies, you had to be part of the church in order to be a voting member uh, for government things. And again, this is limited to men and particularly going to be men who probably own property. But even to do that, you needed to be a part of the church. Uh, so they had to come up with how do we keep people in the church and sort of give them this this way to still participate in being a voting member of government, and that was the halfway covenant. It allowed unconverted members to enjoy the full privileges of citizenship, which means they get to vote, but what happens then, you have unconverted members in the church, and the church is being watered down by the lack of beliefs of these individuals. So that's going to create its own problems as well. Around 1692, the low point hits the Puritan Church, and that is in the same time period then as the Salem Witch Trials. Uh, several young girls in Salem Village, Massachusetts, said they were being afflicted by witches. Um, basically, the basic story of this goes something along the lines of these girls were out when they weren't supposed to in order to uh, take the heat off of themselves. They simply said, so-and-so bewitched us to do this, and people in their fear because witches and the hunt for witches was something that had been going on in Europe and had been carried over into the New World was very common. Uh, they immediately start questioning people and trying to get rid of the witches in their midst. Uh, the problem was in how they would do it. Um, uh, for instance, you know, we're going to test whether or not one individual, one man, ended up dying because he was laid out and they started to put weight on his chest, which was going to compress his chest, keep him from breathing. And he said, you know, do you, do you confess you're a witch? Well, to confess you're a witch meant you're going to lose all your property, get kicked out of the colony. You're going to be hard up. And you weren't. So he says more weight. And eventually so much weight was put on him that he basically suffocates from that weight on his chest. Or people were... Uh, dumped, you know, and basically uh, the idea was, you know, if you if you stayed down, uh, you're a witch, or you drowned. You floated to the top. You know, there was a there was a problem here where someone could could end up dying anyway. Uh, some of these individuals were simply hung. Uh, later down the road. Uh, at least one of the girls confessed to making the story up. It did not change the fact that individuals had died, but nothing happened to those girls e even after the confession was made. Uh, so a low point for the church itself. Now, uh, Anglican and the Anglican Church, Church of England wasn't giving up on being in America, so they sent James Blair, an Anglican who came and in the midst of his preaching, ultimately started the College of William and Mary. And then an Anglican like Thomas Bray, who promoted missionary efforts for the colonies. You know, he's come and he's preached, and then he goes back to England and says, we need to send more missionaries. So you do have Anglican Church in the United States today, although we don't consider it probably one of the larger denominations by any means. We mentioned earlier Roger Williams. Roger Williams founding the first Baptist church in America when we were talking about uh, Rhode Island. And then the Quakers, again, remember they came with William Penn, the Society of Friends. They actually originated with the uh, Englishman George Fox. Um, he claimed to receive guidance from an inner light, and this was part of what the Quakers believed. Um, in their church services, kind of unusual, men on one side, women on the other side, I uh, believe, but basically... Uh, there was not a, a, a preacher, somebody just was hit by uh, one of these inner light thoughts, and so they would give a word of testimony, as it was called. Um, so, again, many people kind of wary of the Quakers a little bit down the road. That would be an issue about whether or not they would fight in the war for independence and even other wars.
Uh, ultimately, we're going to see other denominations making their way into the colonies. Francis McKimmy being considered the father of American Presbyterianism. Uh, Henry Muhlenberg considered the father of American Lutheranism. So these different denominations that were starting up in Europe ultimately making their way to the colonies. The Moravians being the most important pietist group in America. You'll remember uh, with the Moravians, you can go over to Old Salem. Perhaps you went there as an elementary student and you've seen some things about uh, their beliefs and they still have a church that's having services uh, today there at Old Salem. Now, you're sitting in church. We want you to to learn what we want you to know to be a member of this church in good standing down the road. So as a child, we start to teach you catechisms, a summary of denominations doctrine formed in a question and answer method. You know, we ask the question, you give the answer, and you ultimately learn these facts. Uh, as you keep repeating these things, they are going to stay with you, but you do ultimately need that belief system as a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, interesting enough, in this time period then, the Bay Psalm book becomes the first published book in America in 1640. Not a Bible, but a song book to sing from. Now, when you look at uh, reaching out to the Native Americans, John Eliot uh, did something significant. He translated the entire Bible into the Algonquin tongue, which many had to write a language for them in order to teach them then how to read it and have the Bible for themselves. David Brainerd was a young missionary who went to the Native Americans and his work, the journal, was published after his death. He died around the age of 29, uh, but it inspired many other young men to enter into the mission field as well. Again, one of the problems that would ultimately come up about uh, reaching the Native Americans was thinking that you had to first convert them to European thinking, European way of living, in order to see them come to Christ, uh, which again was going to create some conflicts down the road. Uh, ultimately, then as we get to the 1760s, uh, 1730s really, and then again in the 1760s there will be a second one. But you have the time period there on page 66 we call the Great Awakening. Not just a revival, but a powerful social, political, religious force that's going to alter the face of American history. It's going to affect their thinking leading into the war for independence. Jonathan Edwards, perhaps the greatest theologian of this time period, even in American history, remember he's the one, you've seen it in English class probably, that gave us sinners in the hands of an angry God. Uh, you know, it said that people were responding even while he was preaching. Uh, which is sort of significant, kind of given the fact that it was, I think, a red sermon, but yet it was really catching their attention. Uh, and this was ultimately going to expand for decades here in the colonies and renew an interest in turning back to God and seeing uh, people change spiritually and to have an effect then on the future of the colonies. Then you had men like George Whitfield. George Whitfield. Uh, outstanding evangelist of the Great Awakening, the churches didn't like him. So instead of being able to preach in the churches, he preached outside. Ben Franklin said a couple things about him. He once estimated, based on the distance that George Whitfield's voice could carry, that he could have spoken to tens of thousands of people at one time, uh, just with his voice. Um, another thing was he was so um, moving in what he said that he influenced Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin remembers listening to him, and George Whitfield is encouraging giving uh, to a particular ministry like orphanages, and you know Ben Franklin's not wanting to give anything, and then as Whitfield continued, he thought, I'll give a little bit, I'll give a little bit, and pretty soon he was giving a whole lot more. And this was the influence that Whitfield had with his ability to speak. So then what are the results then of this Great Awakening? There's church growth. People are going back to church. Uh, there's religious colleges being started. Again, train ministers so there can be more churches. Transforming the spiritual life of the colonies. Again, people who had become very secular in their thinking are now 
becoming spiritual again, growing, being influenced by what they believe God would want them to do. Again, all of that's going to come about, though, of course, for any of us, if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then finally, the political effects on the colonies. Uh, this was giving people a voice. It was giving people a means of hearing from one another, connecting, which is all going to be important down the road. Uh, this is stressing the equality of all men. All men can come to Christ. Uh, so there's an equality there that's going to be important to them as they would head into uh, their conflict with England and what England is expecting of them and the lack of representation that England is giving the colonies. So all these things are going to be important and carry on into uh, that war for independence as we will move forward. So don't forget with chapter 4 to do all the written things. Be sure you're studying chapters 3 and 4 together for that test when it comes up.